Make your mama proud. If you've ever watched any college football, you've seen a young football player, a young man be approached by someone with a camera and immediately say, hi, mom, when they stick the camera in his face. The reason is there's something special about and unique about the relationship of a young man or boy to his mama. I see it in my son who has a very close relationship to his mother and calls her two or three times a week just to, uh, to video call her actually, show her the kids and visit with her and see her and talk to her. It's, it's something special. And what it does is it makes young men want to make their mama proud. Now, as Christians, though, we shy away from using the word proud, don't we? And it's companion word, pride, because they have deservedly ugly reputations in the Bible. In Proverbs 8, 13, wisdom declares, I hate pride and arrogance. Proverbs 11, 2 tells us pride brings disgrace. And then Proverbs 16, 5 tells us God detests the proud in heart and will be sure to punish them. And so we read that, and there's no wonder we don't want to say we're proud, because it has such a negative connotation to it. Even my least favorite ancient theologian, Augustine of Hippo, if you ever hear me go off on, uh, on Augustinian Calvinism, you'll understand why he's my least favorite, said it well, though. It was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men angels. And so rightfully so, we shy away from saying we're proud. Even when our children do something that we're proud of, we'll start to say, I I'm proud, to, and then we kind of stumble over it because we feel like we shouldn't be saying I'm proud. Well, be proud of your children and of the good things they do. And be proud of each other for the good things they do because despite all of those negative connotations, Paul began his second letter to the church in Thessalonica with a declaration of his pride. Look again in verse 3 that was read for, or verse 4 that was read for us a moment ago by Brady. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God. And so Paul did not hesitate in talking to other Christians and in other churches about the Thessalonian brethren with pride, speaking of them with pride. So we should learn from that that we and be proud of certain things. And so today we'll begin our study of 2 Thessalonians with a lesson called Proudly Proclaimed from 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 1 through 4. Now, for those of you who are kind of new, while I occasionally will break in with a topical sermon or two, my preference is to share the whole counsel of God by working through texts in detailed studies. Last year, we just finished up in December a study of 1 Thessalonians that took 18 lessons. Now, I can promise you we're not going to take a, that many, probably about half of those, to cover 2 Thessalonians. And then we may have some, some lessons that are topical in nature, but then we'll dive back into another book because we're, going, we're here to study God's Word, so we're going to spend our time in God's Word looking at it in detail so that we can learn as much as we can learn. One of the benefits of doing a textual study is it forces me to look at passages that I might want to just kind of skip over and not deal with and dive into. And so it gets us into the whole counsel of God, which Paul said that he preached to them in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 and verse 27. So here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we see in these four verses that Paul is very proud of them and proudly proclaims them and proclaims his appreciation for three things about them. Their growing faith, their gracious love, and their grand persistence. And those are the three things that we'll be looking at this morning. But before we do that, let's do a quick review of how the gospel came to Thessalonica. And then we'll look at these three things as we work our way through that. And I have a chart for you here, a map showing you the trip. I know that the colors really don't show up very well, but hopefully you can see that and see just the, the route that Paul would have taken on his way to Thessalonica. So as we talk about it, think about that, let's just go back to in Acts chapters 13 and 14, Paul went on his first preaching missionary uh, tour, a missionary tour with Barnabas, and they went out through the uh, middle of what's now modern-day Turkey, or in those days it was called Asia Minor, and including a city called Lystra. In Acts chapter 14 
he was in the city of Lystra, and what happened there? Does anybody remember what happened there? You can just raise your hand if you remember. Something very drastic. Well, they, they, they took some, some rocks and some stones and they threw them at Paul and then left him for dead. So they had been there. They came back to, to, went back to Jerusalem and back up to the city of Antioch. You'll see that right there, the city of Antioch in Syria. That's where that, that was kind of his home base that he would go down uh, on his trips, go run through Jerusalem, and come back and stay in Antioch. And so they'd gone down, they, they came back from their trip, their first missionary tour, they stopped in Antioch for a while. And then in Acts chapter 15, we have the huge event of the Jerusalem Council where men had come up from Jerusalem and claiming they had been authorized to teach that men were required, or that, that Christ, Gentile Christians were required to observe the Mosaic law, which meant that men would have to be circumcised and that they had to comply with the law. Paul and Barnabas rejected that. They said, that's not the case. That's not true. That is not the revelation that we have received from God. And so there was a big argument about it. And they took that argument back down to Jerusalem, where these men had come from. And many of the other apostles, some of the other apostles are, were still there as well. And so they went back there to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 and have the Jerusalem conference where they discern that God did not want them to require keeping the Jewish laws or the law of Moses from the Gentiles or require the Gentiles to keep the law of Moses. And so that was a great event and a great decision that was made. And by the way, just as from a standpoint of, of determining authority, you go back to Acts chapter 15, you see where they had direct statements from the will of the word of God. They had examples of the work that the apostles did where the Holy Spirit worked through them and never required them to make anybody, a, a, make a Gentile become a Jew. And then they drew the conclusion, they drew the necessary inference from that that this is what God wanted. Gentiles were free from Jewish law. And so that was the conclusion they were, uh, derived. And they went back to Antioch. And when they got back to Antioch, Silas was one of the men sent back from Jerusalem to confirm that the Jerusalem church was not teaching this. Then after some time, Paul and Barnabas wanted to go back to this church that they had gone to before. And as they were getting ready to go, they had a dispute over taking Mark with them because he had left them on the first trip. And it became so strong that Barnabas went, took Mark and went one way. Paul took Silas, the man who'd come up from Jerusalem, with him and then went on their trip. They went up north, up through possibly uh, through uh, Cilicia, possibly through his hometown. And his hometown of Tarsus is there. So it's likely he went through there. It didn't say that in the text, but likely they went through there. And then they headed east or west, and then they got to the city of Lystra. In the city of Lystra, in Acts chapter 16, he met a young man that probably had witnessed, or possibly at least, had witnessed him being stoned and had become a Christian either right before that or right after that and had been preaching and teaching while Paul was finishing his travels and going back to Antioch. And he saw in Timothy something that he wanted to latch on to and foster this preaching ability and this work with Timothy to do. So he brought Timothy with him and Timothy and Silas and the others, they headed west. They got a little further along the way. They wanted to go south, and the Holy Spirit said no. They wanted to go north, and the Holy Spirit said no. So they kept going west until they came to a dead end at Troas on the Aegean Sea. Now what do we do? The Holy Spirit said, don't go that way, don't go this way. We're not going backwards, we're going forwards. All right, we're here. What do we do? Where do we go from here? And Paul had the vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come into Macedonia and help us. And notice again, what they did was they drew a conclusion. The Holy Spirit didn't say, now that means what you need to do, Paul, is go into Europe and go over to Macedonia. They drew that conclusion. God gives them bits of information, but requires them to use their mind and their will to make decisions in fulfillment of what God wants them to do. And so they went into Europe. First in Philippi, and then in Thessalonica. Everywhere Paul went, he ran into opposition. Remember the uh, Philippian jailer. Everybody knows about the Philippian jailer. Well, why do we know about the Philippian jailer? Because Paul got beaten and thrown in jail and converted the jailer. So that's why we know about it. Then in Thessalonica, they went down there. And we know about Thessalonica as being ignoble because he got run out of town and had to physically flee at night to get away from them because they Jewish believers there are Jewish unbelievers wanted to attack him. And so Paul had taught and preached in the synagogue there, had converted some Jews, 
stayed for a little while, and we don't know for sure how long, probably uh, about six months, because Philippi had, uh, the Philippian church had sent money to him twice while he was there in Thessalonica. And so he was there for long enough to really get the church established, but not long enough to be happy with how well established they were. And so when he had to leave, he left physically, but spiritually and in heart and in his soul, he was back there with them. His heart was with these brethren, even as he went down to Athens. And so when he got down to Athens, he sent Silas and Timothy back to, uh, back to Macedonia and, back, and Timothy specifically back to Thessalonica. Now, the thing, the interesting thing, I wish you see it in chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. So you have these three men referenced in this letter to go to. So Paul goes off from Athens to Corinth, and when he's in Corinth, Timothy and Silas come with the good news. And Paul talked about that, and we went over that in detail in 1 Thessalonians, so we won't go over that again. He loves these brethren. He cares about their brethren. And so when he heard about their faith and their love and their hope, he wrote that first letter to them. And then while he was there in Corinth, there was peace. Finally, he found a place where there was peace and God was watching out for him and giving him an opportunity to teach and stay safe and do so safely. And so they were, they were there long enough to exchange more correspondence with the Thessalonian church. Now, interestingly enough, I have a friend who's been to Thessalonica. Now, this was back in 1974, back in, uh, when he was in the Navy, and they, they had a stop there in Thessalonica, and he took some pictures, and he shared these with me. So I want to share you, show you this, and that's it. I, I looked up trying to find more modern pictures, and they didn't look much better, so <laughs> they didn't look like they've improved all that much. But this is the city of Thessalonica. That's just a courtyard there somewhere, and you notice the windows of the building in the back it's not uh, in good shape but anyway that's just a courtyard in the city of Thessalonica and then there's a, a, a city street main street there and you can tell it's in the 70s from the cars uh, you just get a look at those you can see that that's the 1970s and then there and these don't show up all that well I'm sorry about that these, these are the ruins of the city of Thessalonica where Paul and the brethren there in Thessalonica would have shopped and eaten and lived and did their business. And modern pictures show that there hasn't been a whole lot much uh, done, a whole lot much done to make it look better or to clean it up. Uh, and uh, not a lot more excavation, some, but not a lot. And then this again, this is just to give you an idea. This is where Paul would have walked. See that there's a street there, you can, you can see a road there. Paul would have walked down that road. And the brethren that are mentioned in Thessalonica would have walked down that road 2,000 years ago. Anyway, that's just the city of Thessalonica. I just wanted to show that to you to give you an idea of what it would have, of where Paul was 2,000 years ago. Now, as part of the correspondence with our Thessalonian brethren, Paul wrote the second letter. Because apparently he wrote about the resurrection and the coming resurrection and the coming of the Lord in the first book, and that's still created more questions with them, within them that they needed to answer. And so he's going to address those. But he begins the letter by just basically saying he was proud of them. He was proud of them and so proud of them that he was willing to proudly proclaim their growing faith, which is the first thing that we want to look at this morning, is growing faith. Let's go back to chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians, and read verse 3. He says, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because of your faith, because your faith is greatly enlarged. So he's talking about their faith is growing, it's getting bigger. And so he's proud of them because of that. And he thanks God constantly because of that. And that, that's an interesting word there when he talks about thanking God for them constantly. Because he says, not only do I thank God constantly for you in his prayers. He says it's fitting or it's right. It's the right thing to do because of their faith. So not only is the idea of giving thanks and being proud of people something that it's okay to do, it's fitting. It is the right thing to do. And so he's proud of their growing faith. And the, the idea there is that it's, uh, or the, the word that, that makes that interesting, is that it's the idea of weighing something. So if you go to the grocery store and you want to get a pound of ground beef, 
and you go to a butcher shop and you know they're not wrapped up in a bag and, and you want or, or well maybe you go to the deli and you, you want a pound of, of roast beef. And so you, you go there and you say, okay, I want a pound of roast beef. And you want them to go slice it off and then they'll put it on the scale. Now it used to be in the old days they'd put it on the scale and then they have a one pound weight on one side and the weight for when it when it would level out and meet. You'd want you'd want somebody to get the, the little bit heavier on this side. You don't want the person to get a little bit heavier on that side, on the weight side. Balancing it out. It's the right thing to do. It's fitting to be proud of and to commend people and to thank God for what people do, particularly when they have growing faith. And it's more than growing. It's super growing. Now, let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you've never, ever heard of this little movie franchise called Star Wars. Okay, all right, I don't see any hands going up. Raise your hand if you've never, ever seen a movie, one of the movies, ever. All right. I don't see any hands going up, so the little ones are there. But if you, so, so what that means is that you're all familiar with the fact that the Millennium Falcon always has problems with its hyperdrive. The hyperdrive is always getting them in trouble because it's never working properly. And the word hyperdrive just means superdrive. And it's the exact same word that's here in the text about their hyper faith, their hyper growing faith. It is their super growing faith. It is their hyper growing faith. They had no problem with their faith growing. Their hyperdrive, if you want to pardon the pun there, worked to just fine, the hyperdrive of their faith. It was growing, it was expanding, it was doing what God wanted it to do on a, on a very large scale. In fact, so much so that they had become an example to every other church. Turn back into 1 Thessalonians, and let's look at, at, at the uh, how Paul describes them as an example. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and let's read verses 6 through 10. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 through 10 says this. It says, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia, for the word of the Lord has gone forth, sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith for God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. Let me pause for a second. Think about that. Think about the fact that somebody can just talk about the Lilac Road Church of Christ and say, you know, I go to church, I go to visit some of these churches around here, and all I hear about is the folks at Lilac Road. And the good things that they're doing and the work that they're doing to serve God. That would be amazing. That would be powerful. And that's a powerful demonstration of faith, faith that's growing. Verse 9, they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. They were an example to all. Their faith was growing so rapidly and so powerfully that they were examples to Christians all over that world. And that was the days. That was in the days before the internet and cell phones. You had to have the, uh, the grapevine way of transferring information, trans uh, being carried by people as they talked about what was going on there in Thessalonica. So that is something that is marvelous, and that is something to be proud of, and that's why Paul was so proud of them. Well, the second thing here is their gracious love. Their gracious love. And the word grace is a very big word. It has a lot of usages besides the idea of God's unmerited favor. Now, granted, God's unmerited favor is about as big as you can get. Because God is God and, have, and he is light and in him there's no darkness. He cannot have fellowship with sin, but he reaches out to sinful creatures to bring us in to be a part of him and to be in fellowship with him. That is a magnificent benefit and a gift that God gives us because that's what the word usually means. It's the idea of something given or a gift. Anniversaries. Guys, can I tell you a little something about anniversaries? 
when your wife says, don't give me anything, you better go get her something. You better, it better be good. Trust me, I've learned from experience that don't, don't trust them when they say, oh, I don't need anything. Yes. It's something we give to somebody. It's not something that we owe them. Not something that is a debt that we owe, like a bill that we pay. It's a gift that we give to somebody because we care about them, because we love them. Do you know something else we give each other? Is we give each other ourselves. Think about it in these terms. All of you that are here today are gracing the other person, gracing the other people in this auditorium. All of you are giving each other a gift of your presence this morning. That's why we talk about the value of attending and the need to be in worship and to be at church. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 14, so that's a legitimate term. Be at church or in church. You encourage one another. You gift one another. You're being a gift to and giving a gift to other people of your time and your presence. You're giving me right now the gift of your attention and your time. And I appreciate that so very, very much. Because you don't owe it to me. You're gifting it to me. Thank you. But what that goes beyond just gracing each other with our presence and the idea of gracing each other with love. Paul talked about here going back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 in the last half of verse 3. Because your faith is greatly enlarged. And the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. I mentioned I was going to talk a little bit more about how they had turned from idols, dead idols, to serve a living God back in 1 Thessalonians 1. Most of the converts, or many, some of the converts in, in Thessalonica were Jewish, but a lot of them were Gentile. And when they came to Christ, they had to leave some things. The pagan Gentiles had to leave their pagan lives. They had to set that behind them. They had to put it behind them and, and turn their back on it and walk away, which would mean almost their entire culture. In those pictures, you really couldn't see it, but there would have been idols all over everywhere. And of course, they would have all been gone because of the destruction of that area so many years ago. But every part of their life was filled with idolatry and pagan worship activities. Everything. And it's almost impossible for me to really illustrate this except by doing this. Get rid of your phones. Get rid of your TVs. Get rid of your radio. Get rid of your electricity. That's how ubiquitous, that's how ingrained paganism was. So becoming a Christian was a big deal. And so the idea of gracing one another with their love was huge because they needed each other. They needed each other because their, they, in many cases, were abandoned by their family because their family would get mad. Oh, you're not going to come to the pagan the celebration with us? You're not going to come worship this idol with us? Oh, we're having a feast out of the temple of Diana. You're not coming? You, who do you think you are? You're better than us? You hear that today. I mean, you won't come worship with me where we entertain people instead of preach the gospel? What are you, better than me? You, you had to go get baptized because my baptism wasn't good enough? I don't know how many of you here, I know some of you here, I don't know how many of you here came to Christ after, as an adult and had to leave family and had to be separated from family. Those of us like me who grew up going to church, I mean, I, I've been going to church ever since I was, before I was born. So the idea of walking away and leaving this is something that would be challenging. The idea of coming and being a part of a church is just second nature. It's what I do. It's what I've been doing for 60-something years. So it's difficult, I think, for me and for those of you who are like me to appreciate what those who didn't have that have gone through to 
to be a part of this congregation and to be a part of the Lord's church. The Jews would be ostracized by their families. The Gentiles would be ostracized by their families. They all bound themselves together in Christ, working together and so gracing each other with this gift of love. And this is something that's worth doing. You may be asking, if you know of somebody uh, that has come to Christ and left family or left previous religious affiliations to become a Christian, ask them if they're willing to share with you what that was like. Ask them, did you have to lose family? Did you lose friendships and family relationships? Did your mom or your dad kick you out of the house? That's happened to people. And refuse to have anything to do with you. That's one of the problems with second and third generation Christians like myself. Is we don't appreciate that. Not like those of you who've been through that. So if that is you, and, and uh, if you're that person, hopefully you'll, you'll be willing to share that with others who are not, because we need to know what that was like and appreciate the gift that you're giving us. It is a gracious gift that is abounding and overflowing. It's increasing in exponential growth. That's what makes this church grow, will make this church continue to grow, is us sharing our love with one another. Now, it's not the word. You go back to chapter 3, he says, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, he says, each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. It's not the word hyper. It's just the idea of abundantly growing, overflowing growing. Give each other. Think of the bullet. If you will read, be sure to read the bullet card for that. I didn't write it. I stole it from somebody else. I gave them credit for what their name's on there. Think of the value you bring by gracing this gift, or this church. And gifting this church with you, with yourself, with your, your encouragement, with your loving. And work toward being the kind of person that is considered gracious and giving. Be the person that when they walk in the room, you say, hey, how you doing? It's so good to see you. And they want to talk to you. Don't be the person that walks in, oh, here comes James. He's going to go off on Calvinism. Got to get away from him before he launches again. Don't be that person. Be the, that, that's that way, but be the person that is a gift of love toward each other, toward your brethren. Abound in gracious love. So give yourself heart, soul, mind, and body through the service of the body of Christ to each other. That's the gracious love. And then the third thing is a grand persistence. Grand persistence. That's in verse 4. Verse 4, says, therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance of faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. So their faith and their love sustained their grand persistence, making Mama Paul so proud. That's why Paul was so proud of them. He says that in chapter 2. Go back to 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2. He talks about how he is proud of them. All right. That they made him proud like a mother, like a loving mother. In verse um, seven, he says, "But we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children, having so fond an affection for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God but also our own lives, because you have become very dear to us. And by doing that with one another, then we can have that persistence." We can have that ability to persevere. Now the word here, if you go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, the word speak proudly is a very visual word. It's the idea of neck. Now, every once in a while, we, our children, they embarrass us. And we kind of duck our heads in embarrassment. But a lot of times, they make us proud. And when they make us proud, what we need to do is lift our heads up, get our heads high, our necks high, the necks straight and up, proud of who our children are and of what they're doing, proud of the congregation here and what it is doing, proud of one another in your service to God. Because that's what we're going to need to be able to get through the persevere, uh, to, through the persecution and pressure. And they weren't under a lot of pressure. 
they were under what they were uh, under crushing, or they were being pursued. The, the word here in chapter uh, four, verse four, says, "For your perseverance." The word perseverance there is meaning is the idea of remaining steady under pressure. So the idea of the world putting pressure on people, crushing them, trying to push them down, that's what the world wants to do to us today. It doesn't want us speaking out about Christ. It doesn't want us speaking out about sin that is in the world. It wants us to be quiet and go away. And we've got to bear up under that pressure. Hold up underneath that weight. Think of it this way. You ever buy, a, you go to the store and you're looking for a chair, maybe some lawn chairs or those plastic lawn chairs. And what do you, one of the things you need to do is you pick, turn it over and you read what's the weight limit. You know, how much weight will it bear up on you? We bought our, our grandchildren a swing set for Christmas, and we, one of the things we did was weight bearing. How much weight could it handle? Not because our kids are that big, but just because we wanted, we didn't want a flimsy set. We wanted something that would be sturdy and would last for a while. So we look at them. So we look what, at what it will bear up under, how much weight it will carry. And that's the idea here, is that we are being able to carry weight. Carry the weight of the world's pressure that it tries to put upon us. Not only do they remain steady under the crushing weight, they didn't break under the pressure. Now there are two words here in the text, persecutions and afflictions. Anybody here watch The Fugitive with... Um, Harrison Ford, couple, I, I remember I'm dating myself, that's an older movie. Some of you guys weren't even born when that movie was made, sorry. Well anyway, the idea is that federal marshals, their job is to catch prisoners, and so they chase him, and so as a fugitive, he's running for his life because he didn't kill his wife, and he's trying to prove that he didn't, but he has to escape, and so he's, it's a chase, it's constantly pursued. That's the word there for persecution. It's the idea of being pursued, being chased, being hunted like an animal or a criminal. That's what it was like for these first century Christians in Thessalonica. They were being hunted like animals, like criminals, treated like that. Now, how many of us, after a, a, a little bit of that, can just go, I give up. If I surrender, I, I'm not going to fight this. I'm not going to keep running. I'm not going to keep trying to get away from this. I give in to the pressure. No, they did not. They held up underneath it. And then the second word there is afflictions. Afflictions. The word afflictions is the idea of being squeezed between two things. Now, I don't know about y'all. And there's a gift hint here. <clears throat> I love peanuts. I love them in the car. I love them in a jar. I love them on the plane. I love them on the train. I'll eat peanuts anywhere. Sam, I am. I just love peanuts. Especially roasted salsa ones in shell. Because you get that pleasure of just getting that little that peanut out of there and you crush that shell. Pop the peanut out and that delicious nuttiness comes out. That's the pressure. That's the idea. Imagine being the peanut shell. That's us. We're the ones that are being crushed. They were the ones that were being crushed, being squeezed between two pressure points, trying to conform, being forced to conform. But through all of that, they kept up their part of the work. They kept up their faith. They kept up their trust. And as a result, they endured. That's one of the words, endure, which you endure is the idea of you keep going. You don't quit. They didn't give in to the pressure. They didn't quit. No wonder Paul was so proud of them. Well, let's wrap up with a couple of takeaways. A couple of takeaways and we'll be done. First thing is, proudly proclaim. Every faithful church, the Lilac Road Church of Christ, the Christians who are part of this church, should be proud to say, God lives here in this church. God lives here in my heart. God is my Father. I put my faith and my trust in Him. Proudly say that. Don't mumble or be around the bush on it. Say it. Say it loud and say it proud. Like I said in class the other night. You got a comment? Say it loud and say it proud. Say it. Make it clear. This is who I trust. This is in whom I believe. I am proud to call God my Father and Jesus my brother, my Savior. And I'm proud to call the Lilac Church my family. 
and my friend in Christ. And let God proudly proclaim you are my child. That means have a growing faith and a gracious love and a grand persistence so that God and others can say, I'm proud of them. And the idea is we want God to be able to say, I'm proud of you because you are my children. You serve me. You do my will. You obey me. You keep my will. You serve me from the heart because you love me. I'm proud of you. That's what they want God to be able to say of you and of me. To proudly proclaim, you are my child. That's what we should be taking away from First Thessalonians 1. Well, go ahead and get your song books out, number 285. Number 285 will be a song of invitation. And we're going to, as we sing that song, we're going to invite you, if you're not a Christian, to become one. Because if you're not a Christian, you're not his child. And he's not proud of you. But he wants to be. He wants you to be his child, and he wants to be proud of you. And we want to be proud of you for determining to serve Jesus. Now, that may mean you need to be Believe that he is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess his name, and be baptized in water for the very first time. So that your sins can be washed away. As you bury that old man that died when you repented. And then you can rise as a new creature, a new creation. A child of God, of whom he can be proud. Well, perhaps you're in the audience this morning and you just started doing things that don't make God proud. And you've turned away and gone back into the world. And you're living in a way that brings shame on the Lord instead of pride to the Lord. Please repent. Please change. Make God proud. If we can help you, do that to me in any way.